Ladies and gentlemen, stand up and get loud for the greatest talk show in television history, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Fans Talk Pro Wrestling. This is episode 413 being recorded on Wednesday, March 7th, 2018. My name is Nick, and with me, as per usual, is Adam. How's it going, Adam? Not too bad, Nick. How you doing? I am feeling rested and rejuvenated after a week off. Speaking of, hi, everybody out there. Did you miss us? I certainly hope so, because we missed you. I missed you, Nick. I missed us. I missed it too, buddy. (laughs) Uh, But one thing we have not been missing has been this build to Fastlane. Uh, That has been taking place over the last couple of weeks really in earnest since Elimination Chamber. And Fastlane is going to be taking place this Sunday. Uh, On the date of recording, it will be taking place on the 11th of March. So we're going to be talking a lot about that. We're also going to unpack the uh, the post-show of Elimination Chamber for a little while. Uh, and mostly we'll talk about what did and did not happen in the world of professional wrestling. Uh, starting with some news, what did happen is Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks finally revealed the location for their independent wrestling show, All In. Uh, and it is going to be just outside of Chicago. At the Sears Center Arena. And true to their promise of holding the largest non-WWE wrestling event in history, uh, the venue is going, it has a maximum seating capacity of 11,800 seats. Uh, so, it's Chicago. They probably have a pretty decent shot at packing that place to the rafters. Um, what do you think? Are, are Do you think they're still aiming too big? Or do you think that you know, with the the names behind it, you know, it's Cody and the Bucks are showing up, obviously. Hangman Page, Marty Scrolls going to be there. Tessa Blanchard has committed as well. They've got some uh, mainstream star power and Stephen Amell. He's been announced as being involved. Do you think they are going to breach that 10,000 attendance marker? Uh, I mean, I, I can't really say for sure if they will or won't. I do think that the mindset of going big or going home is exactly the mindset that they should have. I think that uh, is is something that anyone else who has tried to compete with with uh, WWE in in some way uh, has maybe outside of WCW has not necessarily, and they were probably the biggest and best contenders in WWE's history. Um, so I, I think that's kind of what you need to do. I mean. If if it's I've always been a believer in the philosophy that it's better to shoot for the f- stars and miss than to shoot for a pile of manure and hit. So I think that's exactly what the Young Bucks and um, presumably the rest of the Bullet Club that is involved should be doing is shoot for those stars, you know, because at least at least at the end of the day, if you're unsuccessful, you can look back and say, you know what? We tried. We did our best. We put on the best show that we could put in one of the bigger venues that we could put it on at. We gave everybody every opportunity to come and watch us. And now it's kind of on them if they didn't, you know, come to do so. I think that's exactly the mindset you should have. Yeah. And given that Chicago has proven to be more Ring of Honor friendly than perhaps WWE friendly in recent years. I think this is a pretty safe venue for them. Um, maybe the only better one would have been in in SoCal, just because of the the waves that New Japan has been making there of late. But you know, it's still largely the same type of audience, I imagine. So I I feel like they're going to do pretty well for themselves here. I definitely will say. In I think Chicago has a little bit more of a traditionalist wrestling fan base, if that makes any sense. Sure. Um, out here in SoCal, we are known for kind of being a little 
uh, left of center and and oddball and whatnot in some of our chants and, you know, things that we root for and, you know, superstars that we like and stuff like that. And that can be a little bit of a tough market for your very first show in that case. Outside of that, though, I do agree. I, and honestly, I would be fucking over the moon if they were running it here in Southern California. But I do think kind of to your point that uh, Chicago is a little bit safer and you get more of like, like I said, the traditional wrestling fan for whatever that may mean to you. Uh, speaking of New Japan, uh, it was revealed kind of sort of somewhat that uh, Chris Jericho is done with New Japan uh, after something of a, uh, a short stint. Uh, his last appearance there was a New Year Dash when he attacked Naito at, to close out the night. Uh, a lot of people thought that he was going to be facing Naito at their next big show, Strong Style Evolved, uh, taking place later this month. And, uh, you know, there was speculation about what else he might be doing in the company, because for a little while there, it seemed like he was going to be there for a while. Um, but, yeah, in an on interaction with, in Twitter, uh, one asked, uh, is is he done with New Japan? Because he hasn't been seen in a little while. Uh, quote, unfortunately, yes. Why that is, nobody seems to know. Jericho hasn't really explained further, which is, is kind of his modus operandi mm -hmm. uh, d being a tease is, is kind of his bag, but yeah, there's, there's not a Fozzie date scheduled for that. Uh, his wrestling cruise is still a ways off in October. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I would assume it's business related. Like new Japan didn't really see any more money in having him face anybody else. Uh, perhaps, especially with Mysterio slated to, uh, show up for a little while to face Liger. Uh, I, I believe at the same show. So, I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a little bit of a weird situation. Like, do you think this means that he's coming back to WWE, or do you think that he's going to be kind of off the radar until the wrestling cruise? Or what What do you think is going on with Jericho? Uh, I do believe. I'm I'm not sure. I haven't necessarily looked it up or anything. I do believe there is a uh, Fozzie tour in the summertime. I mean, it's still a ways off. He definitely could have worked uh, Japan like now until June or July, I think, is, is when their dates start. But again, don't quote me on that. I'm not positive. Um, I just kind of heard wind of that, I think, on Facebook or something. Yeah, that but, seems to be his usual touring times yeah. during the summer. Sure. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that that's extremely, you know, in effect for his his other stuff. The only thing that comes to mind is uh, potential involvement in WrestleMania. And to be honest, I don't know where you'd put him that would be more worthwhile than than, uh, you know, working dates with New Japan, honestly. But then again, I, I also kind of like the idea of of how you know even in the aftermath of it how uh alpha versus omega was booked i kind of like that sort of special attraction almost uh part-timer-esque thing that now new japan is doing which usually wwe is famous for and you know frankly i feel like they kind of did it a little better um mm -hmm. but you know it is unfortunate too because i think there are a lot of cool matchups you could have had with Jericho and Jericho. I mean, I know everybody in their mother said that even me, you know, in his, uh, in the earlier parts of his last WWE run, when he's facing AJ and stuff like that, that, you know, Jericho's washed up. He's a has been blah, 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 blah. And honestly, like I've been proven wrong by Jericho, uh, more times than I can count on one hand. And I think he's a he's a solid, you know, at the very least, um, veteran, you know, talent that can groom younger talent to, you know, to their next echelon in superstardom. Uh, so it's unfortunate to not see him uh, competing. But like I said, the only reason I could think that he wouldn't be competing for any, uh, New Japan is that he may have mania plans. That seems like. You know, the most recent thing that's happening wrestling related that would possibly cause a conflict between uh, Jericho and New Japan. I don't know what he could be doing for Mania. I don't know if he should be on that show, considering how WWE likes to book Mania and that 
I think anything that he'd be booked in now would be kind of shoehorned in a little bit. Um, and I definitely don't want to see him, you know, only involved like to 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 drop New Japan to only be involved in like the arm bar or something frivolous like that. So I don't know. I don't know, man. It's a mystery to me, too. I would guess that if he is coming back to WWE in in the very short term or a very near future, rather, I would imagine it be for the Raw after Mania. Because you're right, Mania is kind of shaping up right now, and God knows it's not unusual for them to keep changing up their booking until the last minute. Sure, uh, especially in the undercard. Yeah, but yeah, Jericho's a little bigger of a deal than uh, like that year where they very nearly scrapped all the women's matches from Mania and then instead just scrapped another match entirely so they could put on a women's match. Yeah. I, I, I think they would take a bit more care with him were that to happen, whereas the Raw after Mania, that's a little looser. I think that's going to be four hours as well, probably, because everything else like is. Four hours at least. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of where you have your big surprises coming back. It's like it's like New Year Dash after Wrestle Kingdom. So yeah. I, I, I think that would be the plan uh, if, if Jericho is, in fact, coming back. Um, I'm not really sad about him not being with New Japan anymore. Uh, I say with like odds were he had a, a handful of dates that were being talked about. But yeah, I wasn't sure. really excited about him facing off against anybody else. And I, I don't imagine he was either because you listen to him talk over the years. Like, he always reminisced about his time in Japan with fondness, but he never really talked about anything going on in Japan, despite the fact that over the last five or six years, that's kind of been growing in, in the pro wrestling gestalt here in the U.S. And he never evinced any interest in it, at least on air. He never really talked about what was going on with Okada, Tanahashi, Naito. It, it seems like it, that interest only came about when Omega started achieving the heights that he reached over there. So, yeah, for him to take an interest in Omega and give him some something of a rub, I, I see how that came about. I see why he was interested in it. But, like, Naito, as much as fun as that match seems like on paper, I I kind of question whether or not Jericho would really feel any interest in that. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if he would even be interested in facing off against Okada. Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know if that interest was there. And yeah, it's if there isn't any interest there, I, I would rather he step away and pursue other things rather than just try to get booked for a big payday. Yeah. And we all know how well uh, uninterested, not, you know, going through the motions, I guess, uh, Jericho is. You know, I mean, like I said, go back and watch that little feud he had with AJ and stuff like that. You know, I mean. I'm not going to say he's not going to sit there and do his job. He definitely will. He's got that old school mentality uh, and work rate. But you can tell when he's really excited about an angle that he's involved in, he puts his all into it, you know, as opposed to just, you know, do, doing the bare minimum, you know. And I, I don't mm -hmm. I didn't want to see him do that in, in uh, New Japan either. Yeah, it's, especially since they don't play that shit. Well, it is a very different atmosphere over there. It's. At least nowadays, there aren't really any egos like you would see or hear talked about in the WWE. Um, it's very much a cooperative atmosphere. Everybody's working together to push for the company. Yeah, you've got Okada as a golden boy. Yeah, you have Tanahashi as the ace. Yeah, you have Naito as the, the people's the people's champion, essentially. But, you know, there is that larger Japanese corporate mentality where – it's for the greater good. It's for the good of the company, not just my own interest over everything else. Jericho, I don't see slotting into that mentality terribly well. Um, just my take. Sure. Uh, but continuing in the vein of New Japan, uh, 
they've been uh, open in the process of opening up a new dojo in L.A. And recently it was announced that Shibata is going to be the head coach there. Uh, for those that are unaware, Shibata has been on the shelf for a little while. Uh, he went to the hospital a couple of years back now with a lot of head trauma. Um, and I, I can't recall exactly when the, the, the tipping point was achieved, but you know, he had a lot of headbutt based offense. Uh, if you've ever seen one of his matches, like especially against Ichi or Makabe or Goto, the dude went hard. Uh, he didn't really have a lot of limits on what he was willing to put himself through. And the man had fantastic matches, but you know, he, he, he beat the shit out of himself. And for a little while, nobody was really even sure whether he'd be able to see properly, whether he'd be able to walk. Um, he just had a lot of shit going on. Fortunately, he's made great strides in his recovery. Uh, nobody knows yet whether he should be medically cleared to return to the ring. Uh, some people are really rather hoping that he doesn't. Because, you know, look what he did to himself once. And you know, the way he's been talking about his recovery, some people aren't exactly sure that he's learned his lesson about what got him there in the first place. But... Hopefully, this is going to kind of uh, redirect him in, in a in a way that you know he's still involved with the product, he's still involved with the company, he's providing meaningful insight, and he, he's teaching students, and he, he's he's nurturing young wrestlers in, in a way that you know hopefully will provide stars for the company in a way that you know isn't controversial, isn't you know, um, doesn't have the same stigma attached to the traditional dojo that New Japan has been bringing Young Lions up in, uh, you know, with the, um, you know, all the the stories and the rumors of the hazing and and, and just the, the old school garbage that wrestlers would put young boys through. Um, and this is very rambly because I, I, I have a lot of thoughts about this and the Shibata, about Shibata in particular, about the dojo. Um, but yeah, th this seems like a a good new chapter for New Japan. They're they're expanding their foothold in the states. They're I I don't think there's really a better guy that they could put in that position than Shibata. Uh, again, he's a very accomplished wrestler. He's a very gifted technical wrestler. Uh, I don't know if there is anybody better that you could learn fundamentals from than Shibata. And you know, w with his right hand man being Scorpio Sky, who has his own long tenure in pro wrestling here in the States, you know, those are two guys that you can learn a hell of a lot from. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm excited to see where this goes. I'm excited to see the crop of talent that could spring forth in this. Like the last dojo that they had in California, you know, you had Samoa Joe going through there, Daniel Bryan, uh, Shinsuke Nakamura trained there, uh, Okada trained there as well. You know, just all kinds of uh, who's who of names that showed up there and put in work there and, and trained there and then went on to do insane, incredible things in the industry. I, I, I really hope this, this does at least as well and lasts a hell of a lot longer. I agree. Yeah. Th that was a lot of rambling on my part. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries. I, I, I had a lot to unpack there. I, again, Shibata, it, it was such a tragic story that happened and you know, it, it seemed like he wasn't really going to be able to do anything. So this is just, it's kind of a feel good story from sure. where I'm sitting. Sure. I mean, adding to the fact that, uh, uh, Scorpio sky might be involved. Uh, I think that that's, that's also cool. Scorpio sky is great, great hand in the ring, great talent to teach, uh, to teach other, other, uh, up and coming wrestlers. Um, how to wrestle, I think. Um, so that, that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge of, of, uh, the people involved, but it does seem like they have a pretty good head for, uh, who they want involved and who they want, you know, training their next generation. And, uh, you know, I wish them the best, first of all. And secondly, I, I think you guys seem like you have a pretty good idea on your hands. So, so run with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, shifting gears, uh, from feel good to, just kind of shitty. Uh, 
Impact recently aired the uh, very controversial spot where uh, Sammy Callahan was facing Eddie Edwards in singles competition. And I have not watched the episode. I, I have not been watching Impact regularly, so I don't know the storyline. But there was a point where in Eddie was down, Sammy had a baseball bat, and presumably the spot was that he was going to swing the bat down on a chair over Eddie's head. What wound up happening was the chair bounced, the bat ricocheted off the chair and blasted Eddie in the face. Um, Eddie wound up getting his orbital bone fractured. Uh, some other head trauma went on, he was bleeding like a stuck pig. And, you know, he got rushed to the hospital afterward and was in recovery for a little while. So that spot aired on TV and long story short, Sammy has been, uh, to put it politely, unrepentant about it, uh, basically being kind of a garbage human about it, uh, saying he wouldn't apologize. He doesn't regret what he did. Uh, he's gone on to make merch of it, uh, putting Eddie's bloody face on a T-shirt and then talking about how. Uh, he wonders how much his bank account will go up because of this. And it's it's drawn a lot of criticism from fans, from pundits, from uh, other figures in, in professional wrestling, other figures that are only slightly affiliated with professional wrestling now. Uh, perhaps most notably, Cassius Ono actually called him out for it, which that delighted me to no end just to see a famous Ohio wrestler gets schooled by another more famous, more talented Ohio wrestler. That that was kind of poetic for me. But I don't like this 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 trend of wrestlers that, that started with Sammy. Well, it didn't start with Sammy, but in, in recent years, Sammy's kind of spearheaded it. And uh, like Sammy Callahan, the uh, the the Christ brothers, the Christ brothers, like his buddies in OVE, Ohio versus everybody. Uh, other guys like Nick Gage, just trying to make kayfabe a thing, except it applies in the most brutal, bloodthirsty way possible, where they, they're they trying to blur the line and paint themselves as bloodthirsty psychopaths. I, I don't like that trend. I'm not talking about hardcore wrestling and, and blood in wrestling and things like that. Like that has its place. I'm it's not my cup of tea, but I'm fine with it being a thing. It's when wrestlers like Sammy Callahan or Nick Gage go so far as to paint themselves as no, we're not playing a character. We're really this batshit insane. That just seems like it's setting wrestling back. Like it's it feels like a teenager rebelling for the sake of rebelling just to see how many pearls get clutched by by their parents by by the the old ladies in church and i think that we should be past that wrestling should be better than that like wrestling has been a thing for a long long time now i i i would think that it it should have matured as an art form by now and the fact that this kind of bullshit still has this kind of platform on arguably the second biggest national wrestling company in the States, that, that's just really disappointing to me. I, I agree. Ultimately, you know, I, I understand um, that wrestling uh, is and was a entertainment medium that obviously blurred the line between what's real and what's fiction. That's, that's been the argument that a lot of wrestling fans, even now, even in 2018, have still had to deal with, you know, what does someone who's not a wrestling fan tell you as soon as they hear that you are one? Yeah, but you know, it's fake, right? And it, it pisses us off to a certain extent because, you know, I think all of us, even as fans know the work that goes into, uh, into, choreographing a match and and uh being able to pull off moves without hurting your opponent at least not severely um and and all those things 
But at the same time, I kind of feel like the the old school mentality of, you know, heels and faces don't hang out with each other and all that stuff. There are parts of it that I will miss, but I'm willing to sacrifice putting those in the past as long, if it puts behavior like this in the past as well. Because at the end of the day, uh, just as, as a actor or TV star or, you know, any, you know, sometimes even musicians, depending on who it is, uh, would, would do, there is a difference between your on camera, on stage presence and the person you are in real life. And blurring that line tends to only bring negative things for the most part. It, it confuses people. It makes them wonder, you know, what they should believe as being real and it's it's usually not a beneficial wondering i mean you know to 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 bring up a another you know very famous hardcore icon uh mick foley was devastated when uh the rock did not come backstage to check on him after their i quit match after all those chair shots you know because mick foley is a real person despite the guy that we see on camera as mankind or cactus jack or even himself it's still a different human being once he's gone back behind that curtain and it's extremely disrespectful to you know at the very least not show some sort of either remorse or sorrow or something to a fellow wrestler that you have injured you know very severely on accident at the very least, that's the respect you should pay. If you want to sort of blur the line with the fans, I'm still not super happy about that. But I will uh, I will relent on, on that because, listen, I'm not a professional wrestler myself. I don't know what should be the right or wrong thing, having never competed in a ring myself or all that stuff. But if you don't respect the person that you're working with, at least enough to say, hey, listen, I'm sorry for breaking your orbital, orbital bone when I didn't mean to. That's that's shitty, man. That's that's really shitty. And it, it only sours your, you know, your time in the business. People are not going to want to work with you if that's the type of person you're going to be, whether it's for kayfabe or any other reason. Yeah, it makes me wonder because I have seen people defend this spot, like saying it was an accident. Uh, what do you do with an accident except move forward and, and try to incorporate it into storyline? I think there are ways you can acknowledge that an injury happened and have the bad guy be unsympathetic. Sure. Get uh, take advantage of this, this, this momentum, this, this idea that he's a bad, bad man. I, I think there are ways you can do that. I think the way they handled DJ Z back when he broke Jesse Sorens's neck, I think that was a decent way to go about it because he didn't talk about being a neck breaker or, or being a dangerous man. He, he, he was just more and more of an asshole just in general. And he didn't directly address what he did ever, but people knew what he did and him still being an asshole just kind of built on that. I I think that what I think making money off of this shit is crossing a line. And I I wonder if a guy would get away with that if he didn't have the the name the the of Sammy Callahan. Like if he wasn't so influential in the business, I don't know that anybody would be giving the dude the benefit of the doubt. Sure. And, and there's just lines, I think, that you don't cross. It, it kind of harkens a little bit to, you know, like the Vincent Van Death angle or uh, Eddie Guerrero and, and Rey Mysterio. I'm your poppy or, you know, all the other times that, you know, look, fucking even even something like CM Punk taunting, uh, taunting, you know, Undertaker with Paul Bearer's death. You know, there's just some things that I don't know that you need to go that far to get heat. I mean, especially when most of the time the guys that were involved in those angles are good enough to get 
heat on themselves without having to resort to, in my opinion, cheap tactics like that to do it. You know, it, it, mm-hmm. it, it, it very much harkens, I think, similarly in that vein. I don't think you need to, you know, like you're saying, make merch or or go as far as you're going with this. Just have the heel say, listen, I'm not remorseful. And that's that. And move on. And then you have, uh, you know, a storyline built in for when Eddie Edwards returns or, you know, whenever that's as far as it needs to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, apparently Eddie Edwards has, has made his full recovery by now. Um, he is working again. I believe, uh, impact had a, a set of tapings, not too long ago when he was part of that. So, uh, I'm glad he made his full recovery. Um, I hope this shit does not happen again. I just uh, the injury in general. It is that something pretty heinous to to bounce back from. But uh, uh, apparently he has done just that. Uh, in something of a similar vein, uh, shifting over to WWE centric news, uh, Jeff Hardy has been medically cleared to return to in ring action. Um, he was sidelined uh, a while back, back in late September, uh, with uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, he suffered some injuries uh, building up to that, and he's been on the mend. But uh, yeah, the news is out that he's been back, or uh, he he will be back. Excuse me. Uh, WWE confirmed it themselves on Monday Night Raw. And I would imagine that he is going to be making an appearance prior to Mania, perhaps at Ultimate Deletion uh, at the Hardy Compound. Yeah, seems pretty likely. Uh, yeah, I, I can't think of a, a better place to to bring him back prior to Mania anyway. Uh, may, maybe you save him for the night after Mania. I don't know, but yeah, I, think, uh, I think if they're I mean, and this is assuming that WWE is going to do it. Uh, similarly, or if at all possible, better than Impact did. I mean, don't 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 reinvent the wheel here. <laughs> you know, just just have you know have it function the way that it always functioned. You already ha- you already had the blueprint for what made these successful and an attraction that people were entertained by. So I, I don't see why you wouldn't. You know, I I don't think there's I think there's more of a benefit to having Jeff in the ultimate deletion than there is having him on the, uh, mania or yeah. Raw after mania. Yeah. Um, there are a number of different ways you could go about that. Um, me, I was going to say, maybe you have another one of Jeff's alter ego show up. I, I, I think the WWE would prefer to just have Jeff come back first. Considering, um, considering how, um, I don't know what the word dogged impact has been with their, their, uh, you know, licensing and trademarks and whatnot. I don't think we're going to see Willow or or heal Jeff Hardy like we did in the well, past. I, I mean, Willow and Itchweed are, are are Jeffs. Like they existed long before they showed up on Impact. So, sure, like, I I don't think that would be an issue. I I think it would just be an issue of we want Jeff's return to be a big deal and diluting it with. People looking at Itchweed and saying, oh, that's Jeff Hardy. Why is he dressed weird and talking funny? Uh, I, I think they would just want that big pop yeah. uh, when, when Jeff first shows up. Yeah. If they did something similar to um, how the uh, well, the first one was the final deletion, right? I think between, final deletion was first. Between Jeff and Matt, I think so. Um if they did something, well, I guess no, it wasn't. It wasn't during that match, but I, well, it, it kind of was where they did the flash of Willow, but it wasn't Willow. It was like some other dude, or how they when they dipped uh, when he dipped Jeff in to heal him, how he kind of popped up for. If they did something like that, where it was like a brief cameo, like I'd be into it. I don't know if WWE is ballsy enough to do that, but if they did, I, I'd, I'd I'd get a kick out of it. Yeah, um, I guess. Just a quick question. Should they bring Jeff back at the ultimate deletion? Do you think they do you think they change up that feud at all? Like, do you think it becomes Jeff versus Bray with Matt kind of in the background? Or uh, would that become a tag team scenario where Bray uh, finds another guy or it's possible? I mean, if that was the case, I sure wish they weren't pushing uh, 
Bray with the, or I'm sorry, uh, Finn with the Balor Club as much because I feel like a tag team match between obsolete Jeff and and Woken Matt Hardy versus Bray Wyatt and Devin Finn Balor would at least be very fun. Whether it made sense or not. You're never going to let that go, are you? Nope. Nope. <laughs> never. Never, ever. Just put it all in a big old pot is what I say. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I honestly, barring that, I'm not exactly sure who you pair with with Bray. I don't think they'd put Braun back with him. Braun's too too hot for that shit right now. Um, and then the Blood and Brothers have their own thing going on. I guess you could bring a new Wyatt member, but I don't know who that would be. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The I only wanna... th- Sorry, go ahead. The only thing I could see uh, them putting Braun back with Bray for in such a scenario is if they wanted to spin off Jeff with Braun and kind of harken back to that uh, Hardy versus Taker feud. Um, just in terms of, of the general vibe where you had such a big dominant force as the Undertaker – and you had the plucky underdog in Jeff. Um, it's a little less of an underdog now that he's he's bulked up some and he's the veteran now. Multi-time but, world champion. Yeah. <laughs> but with Braun being as dominant a monster as he is, I I think you could still kind of get away with that. Sure. But I, I couldn't really see Braun pairing up with Bray under any other circumstance. I, even that, I think, is kind of beneath what plans they might have for Braun post mania yeah. even leading to mania uh so i don't i don't think that i mean it anything's possible but i don't think that's going to happen um i i, I honestly i just kind of want to see what wwe's version of the final deletion is if it's any better than than impacts i mean i don't really have super high hopes considering their version of broken matt hardy has been kind of lukewarm at best um mm. but at the same time, it's WWE, and while I know in part like some of the charm to Final Deletion was the really cheesy effects, I'm curious what a like you know blockbuster esque uh, version of that would be. But then again, you also have the House of Hardcore, uh, which was terrible, and or House of Horrors. I mean, sorry, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry <laughs> Tommy Dreamer. Um, <laughs> Uh, you had the House of Horrors, which technically had all the potential uh, production value that WWE could throw at it. And yet they really didn't do anything. So I don't know. I'm really curious to see what this is going to be. That, that's I'm like morbidly curious of it. Yeah. Every time they've gone outside of an arena for a confrontation with Wyatt – be it the House of Horrors or yeah, uh, day, any of the buildup leading to that. Yeah. yeah, the New Day visiting the Wyatt compound. Like, all of that was just pure straight garbage. Yeah. Now, there could be a mitigating factor here if there are any or if there is any truth to the rumor that Jeremy Borash did go to the WWE when he left Impact because Borash was heavily involved in a lot of the Hardy compound stuff. And the video package makes me wonder if Borash has a hand in it. Um, I don't really see him being a guiding hand, even if he is there, just because it is a WWE and there are so many other cooks in the kitchen there. Yeah. But what if Borash and the Hardys did have some kind of license to try and recreate that magic? I mean, I think they have uh, the right groundswell for it. You know, I think that sort of morbid curiosity is the same thing that that led to the final deletions success. You know, everybody was just th- there was such a weird, odd strangeness. And, you know, similar to Jericho's little promo uh, explaining why he kissed Stephanie McMahon that one time, you know, it's the roadkill. You see it at the side of the road and you don't want to stare at it. And yet you are compelled to not look away type of mentality, which I think works really well for these things. So if if Jeremy is also working with them and giving and, and WB is giving he and Matt free license to do something great with this, I think that's the right move. Honestly, I think that's yeah. exactly how they they 
can again build on the success than Impact built. But uh, you know that remains to be seen. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I think that there is still a desire in the audience to see that again because when when uh, Matt showed up on the screen and, and said there is one way to settle this and it has to be at the Hardy compound, I, you did get that reaction that right. people have been having over broken Matt for a while before WWE. Yeah. And like, again, just that video package that that had more similarities with the impact stuff than anything else that's happened since Matt became woken. Right. And then they, they promptly ruined it just by having him do that dumb little laugh and to close things out. But sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't think the WWE has completely turned people off of that idea yet. So I, I, I think the desire is still there. I think that they can still salvage it. Yeah. Honestly, it would actually make a lot of sense as to why uh, Woke and Matt Hardy has been sort of lukewarm lately. Because as I recall, and again, I wasn't as faithful uh, in watching all of the stuff develop in Impact when it did. But as I recall, when Matt first became broken, it was kind of this weird off-putting thing that, that kind of had that same lukewarm reception at first up until – they finally blew it off at final des- uh, final deletion. So it would make a lot of sense if, if you know, if that's what we're leading towards. I know that's also kind of putting all my eggs in one basket uh, with a lot of hopeful and wishful thinking. But, you know, I, I try and stay positive. So that- that's what I'm hoping for uh, come Mania time. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, one final bit of news. Uh, it's kind of a twofer. Uh, the WWE announced on – they announced part of this on Raw. Uh, they announced both of these stories on, on Monday. Uh, but the WWE is going to both Australia and Saudi Arabia with major pay-per-view level events. Um, in October, they are going to Australia, uh, specifically Melbourne – or Melbourne, excuse me – uh, they're going to the MCG Arena, which is a hundred thousand seater, and uh, the the story right now is that they are going to be having a pay per view there. Uh, that that is the bare bones of what has been released. Uh, no idea yet if it's going to be a Raw event, if it's going to be SmackDown, or if it's going to be a uh, combined roster. But more specifically, uh, the WWE is putting on a combined roster event. At the end of April, on the 27th to be precise, in Saudi Arabia, uh, they're holding a 50-man rumble in the King Abdullah Sports City in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they're pretty much pulling everybody into this thing. Like, uh, I would be hard-pressed to name a member of the men's roster that isn't a part of this event. Um, no idea yet what the full card is going to be. I would assume that there is going to be or there will be other matches besides this rumble. Uh but yeah, they're they're really making a big push internationally. Um Saudi Arabia, that's part of an ongoing deal that they've had for the last few years. Uh they have also announced plans that they're only going to be strengthening ties uh in Saudi Arabia as part of that country's own economic uh initiative. But the Australia event is is a little not weird but it it was a little unexpected for me and i I do wonder if that's a response to new japan's push in australia of late uh they've they've gone on tour there in australia and new zealand uh over the last couple months so obviously i'm sure wb fans in both countries are, are simply thrilled to have this um I've seen a lot of outcry from the, from UK fans about how they still can't get a pay-per-view since uh, that one way back in London all those years ago with British Bulldog. But uh, this is this is kind of cool. I mean, this is the first ever 50-man Rumble that will be taking place uh, at the end of April. I don't know if we've ever seen a 100-seater uh, or 100,000-seater arena host an event uh, by the WWE, not since the Silverdome. Uh, yeah, that allegedly. Would be the closest one. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, at this point, all all I can really say is this is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, do you think this is going to be kind of an outlier for the company or do you think like this is going to be representative of their international efforts moving forward? Um, I mean, honestly, I think it's a good move. My first question coming in, is it going to be for anything? Does is it just, you know, to have a really cool match in Saudi Arabia or like does this actually have some implication for, you know, coming back home and, and you know, for the stuff we see week to week? Um, it doesn't have to outright, but, you know, being a really huge rumble, I think it would kind of help, uh, I guess, both sides of the coin. Like, I think it would it would really help to kind of put a big event like that for something really important in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and again, like you said, build that sort of international uh, vibe that it seems like WB wants to go for now. Um, and it could also, you know, have have, you know, American viewers like myself, you could have a reason to tune in uh, and, and pay attention to it and watch it and also, you know, have have a reason for the Saudi Arabian fans to continue watching week to week if, if they receive the programming, of course. Um or at least if it's at a decent hour, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that all works. Uh, either way, I, I think that would be a good, you know, I think that would be a good precedent to set, you know, and and doing big events like this that actually matter to the WWE as a whole. It's not as a whole. It's not just a throwaway thing. Like you know, sure, it's cool to see when when gender was champion. It's cool to see promotion for gender versus Triple H. Uh, in India, but I mean, we all know how that that match is going to end by the end. Like, we're not going to see a Triple H uh, uh, title reign start there because it's not being broadcast where their you know their major market is. So that kind of feels a little bit more throwaway. It's I'm sure it was great to see Triple H compete in that match, but it, it, this is I think a better way of doing it. Like, you don't have to stick to, you know, necessarily the international schedule and, and, you know, adhere to that. But at least you can kind of give, you know, both sides what they want. You can give a really great show to an international fan base and you can give, you know, uh, your your uh, hometown fans something to tune in for. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I uh... There hasn't been any information released on uh, on broadcast, like if this will be broadcast internationally. I I would assume it would be. Um, okay, I assume this is going to be on the network, but I didn't yeah, uh, sure. this is billed as a Royal Rumble. Uh, so I would be surprised if there wasn't some kind of st- uh, not stipulation um, reward on the line for the winner. Uh. Yeah, because the press release is, is just kind of general. Uh, it says it's going to be featuring Cena, Triple H, Reigns, AJ, Braun, The New Day, Orton, Wyatt, and Nakamura, among others. Um, but yeah, they're they're going and putting the label on it, Royal Rumble, specifically the greatest Royal Rumble. So I, I have to imagine that perhaps after Mania, they will be giving the winner a shot at the champion of their choice. Um, it's, it it just doesn't make sense to me otherwise. Uh, a Royal Rumble with, with no with with no stakes, especially if it's going to be the greatest one, that, that feels weird to me. Yeah. But yeah, um, I imagine we're definitely going to be getting more information as uh, the the time after Mania draws closer uh, perhaps when this actually can be a focal point. Um, so far, all eyes are turned toward that damn sign. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, more more to follow, I guess. Yep. Uh, but that is going to do it as far as news. Um, I guess a little bit of a mixed match challenge update. Um, last week we saw Miz and Asuka go over Balor and Banks. Uh. Probably as expected. I, I imagine Miz and Oscar are going to go pretty far on this just because it's Asuka. Uh, and then this week, Alexa and Braun went over Naomi and Jimmy Uso. Again, as to be expected. Um, I guess a noteworthy thing about 
the mixed match challenge this past week was they keep teasing the sexual tension between Alexa and Braun, uh, which feels weird to me because it's not exactly like Alexa's relationship with Buddy Murphy is a secret. So I don't know that that just feels a little weird. That's something that's never stopped WWE booking before. <laughs> no, no, it really isn't. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I won't go so far as to say it doesn't sit well with me. Like I'm, I'm not gonna like shake, shake my finger at them in disapproval just yet. Um, but yeah, it, it, I'm sorry, man. I just got a mental image of you like with a, with a. Uh, I can't remember the hairstyle, so never mind. But basically dressed like a grandma, <laughs> shaking your finger out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I guess until they they pull these shenanigans in front of Buddy Murphy as he's watching at ringside, like, it, it's okay, I guess? Early um, 2000s booking for the win. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm not really watching the Mixed Match Challenge anyway, so yeah, sure. I don't really have a stake in it. Right. Uh, but let's see here. Should we talk what happened on Raw and SmackDown first, or should we, uh, unpack the Elimination Chamber first? Um, I mean, I feel like we can kind of, like, mash them together a little bit as needed. All right. Uh, well, let's see. This first Raw deal, I, I guess we talk, uh, some mania booking. Uh, sure. Kurt Angle set the match. For Mania, uh, him and Ronda Rousey versus Triple H and Stephanie. Um, I don't really like any of this story. Uh, like Ronda has been vacillating between the badass that I think everybody wants to see and the this overwhelmed super fan. Uh, she's been almost Bailey esque at times, which. Given the reputation that the WWE is so hell bent on cultivating for her, just it, it it's wrong. Like I I I shouldn't. I feel like I shouldn't be seeing Ronda Rousey in that light. Like not on TV, not on Raw. So it, it kind of ruins the mystique for me and makes an already laughable angle e- even worse. Like, what what's been your tank? on all this like it is is there any kind of legitimacy to this storyline still um i mean it it is basically like taking the part-timer slot i think the spectacle match that we usually see at uh, mania with just a lot of like fanfare and and hype thrown at it um so it's not something that I'm super surprised to see. Um, I do definitely see the Bla- the Bailey illusions, and that is a little disheartening. And it also makes me wonder if that's partly why they've been, you know, um, shunting Bailey for so long. Uh, I will say the one advantage that Rousey has to playing that character that I kind of like is that 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 switch into you know super fan to badass. Is something that I think even on Bailey's best day, we've never really gotten to see. I'm not saying she's never been aggressive uh, in her portrayal, but I think her, her most aggressive is like see Snickers commercial. Um, and I like that, that Rhonda kind of has at the very least the notoriety to back up that like, yeah, when she gets serious, when she starts making that scally face, there's some legitimacy behind it. Um, which I enjoy. Outside of that, though, I, I will admit, I, I don't think I, I actively dislike this. I'm kind of indifferent to it. It seemed odd that out of nowhere, with no provocation, Kurt Angle would just be like, oh, and by the way, remember all that shit that you were talking backstage? I'm going to tell it to everybody right now. Like, I know there was some animosity between him and Triple H months ago, but you would have thought that based on how storylines have progressed – over TV that the things may not have been completely hashed out, but it had, it had simmered quite a bit. And now for whatever reason, angle decided, you know what? I'm just going to fucking be an asshole to Kurt or I'm sorry, to triple H and Stephanie, uh, for no fucking reason. I mean, I, 
I get that it sets up the match and that's fine, but it's just, it's, it felt weird and out of place for me. It didn't really feel natural. And I know that's something that I've complained about many times in the storytelling woes of WWE, but this one felt like particularly so. Um, outside of that though, the match happening, I'm, I'm fine with, I'm sure it's going to be at least mildly entertaining to watch. I think it's not a bad, you know, marquee match for, for Ronda to start with kind of get, get a, you know, I don't know, get, get a, a notch under her belt, so to speak, before she actually starts to get into, you know, proper women's competition, which I hope is what's going to lead to, you know, her post mania, uh, booking. But yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of whatever about the match. I hated that contract signing at Elimination Chamber. Uh, I think Vegas was a really bad place to do that. And it's weird because I've seen people say that Vegas was the best place for this to happen. But and because Vegas is UFC town, because that is apparently Ronda's backyard, like hometown crowd advantage. I, I don't understand where people are coming from when they say that, because Vegas is very much UFC town. And in the eyes of UFC fans everywhere, Ronda is a failed fighter. Ronda is a sellout. Ronda is a loser. That audience is very fickle when it comes to who they they back in any given fight, in any given event. And for Ronda to go to WWE, that audience did not like that. So I I don't understand that position to begin with. I don't understand why you throw Ronda out there on her first real event where she's going to be speaking and everything. Why you throw her out there with, with no prior appearances. So from that side of things, that was really dumb. And then you put her with Kurt, who has just been miserable as an authority figure. Just not a great promo since he's been back. He, he's been in this dumb Jason Jordan angle since, God, how long has it been? Way too long. Almost a year since yeah, he did God, on, yeah. on, on Raw, pretty much. The, yeah, that, and he's, he's just been floundering for a long, long time. And for him to be the guy that is supposed to be looking out for Ronda, to, to make sure that Triple H and Stephanie don't take advantage of her. I get why that makes sense on paper. Because Kurt Angle is a gold medalist who, who won the gold medal, the broken freaking neck, is a veteran, he's won countless titles, he's a Hall of Famer, all of that. On paper, that makes the most sense. But you look at what he's been doing for the past year, and none of it makes sense. Like... I don't know why you would have that segment and the subsequent segments and expect that to go well. And to say nothing of Triple H's performance at the contract signing, like, I swear the dude was drunk. Everything was slurred and drawn out. It, that was just a bad segment. And then to drag that on under, under Raw, it, Triple H closing out a segment for, by just sucker punching Kurt out of nowhere. And that, that face Kurt made, by the way, was <laughs> – that was spectacular. Very memeable. Yeah, uh, as evidenced by our group photo in the Facebook group. Yes, and countless others across the internet. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just been – it's just been bad. I – it's been hard to derive any enjoyment from it. And you see little bits of what it could be. Like when Rhonda forgets that she's a fan and, and she puts on the mean face, like that immediately tells you shit's going down, shit has gotten real. And I like that feeling. I like that vibe from her. Mm -hmm. And when Angle got pissed and called out Triple H and started stepping to him, you saw what made him such a mainstay on impact all these years. Like, he's still got it. 
he can still be that guy that you want him to be. I, I just don't think they've been using him well in the slightest. And it's, it's going to be hard to recover from that with just a little over a month out, out from Mania. Uh, they're going to be keeping this up week in and week out because we know that Ronda Rousey is going to be a, a weekly appearance on Raw. But I, it's hard to derive any faith that it's going to get better because the authority angle is long played out. And I, I don't really want to see this match. Kurt Angle versus Triple H in a singles competition. I, I don't even really want to see that, but I want to see that more than seeing them weighed down basically by two non-wrestlers. Like this just feels like Angle and China versus Jeff Jarrett and Karen. Like went way, way back in impact. It, it, it's just not a recipe for success in my mind. That's fair. Uh, speaking of a recipe for success, um, this, this ongoing story where Vince seems to think that there's money and selling the idea that John Cena can't get on the card for Mania. And so he's got to go to SmackDown to get a shot at the WWE title and then proceed to build his appearance in this SmackDown match exclusively on Raw. That... That doesn't make the slightest bit of sense to me. Like, why isn't seen on SmackDown? It's not like there's anything really important going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, it is very strange. And it definitely, this is not how I saw Cena's uh, free agency being used. You know, for the most part, I feel like him having gone back and forth between Raw and SmackDown has worked relatively well. They haven't necessarily fought tooth and nail to have him compete, but you definitely see, or at least you get the inference that, uh, the, the, uh, the general managers are attempting to vie for his interest. You know, this is just like, all right, well, uh, I screwed up in the elimination chamber. So now I'm just going to be in the, the multi-man SmackDown match for no reason, because, Obviously, I'm not going to win it, <laughs> but hey, we needed a sixth guy because we needed three other guys before uh, when when it when you know before we built it up to be something like AJ Styles versus uh, the Yet Movement or whatever. You know, we needed we needed all these extra guys, even though we know that none of them are coming away with the title. I'm pretty sure, like unless WWE really wants to be super swervy and just really keep us away from that AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura match, which I don't think is the case. So uh, the whole thing is just kind of meh to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cena versus AJ versus Nakamura sounds like a very WWE thing to do. Yeah. I really hope that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, I will say I'm pretty sure this was last week on Raw where – Cena did the whole tease of challenging The Undertaker at Mania, and the crowd lost their collective shit, and he goes on to talk about how what an astounding match that's going to be, like 39 WrestleManias between them or something like that, and not once have they ever crossed paths, and just building it up and building up and building it up, and then yanking the rug out from under it and saying it's not going to happen because it can never happen now. Like that part of his promo where he just had the crowd in the, in the palm of his hand. Like it's that kind of promo that reminds you why Cena has been on top as long as he has. Sure. Like that. I appreciate it. I it, believe, it's, I believe though, and I just correct me if I'm wrong here, but didn't they cross paths when Taker was champion way back when, when he was undisputed champion and, and Cena had just, been a heel. I mean, I know it was a WrestleMania. Yeah, I, I, I feel think like they wrestled a was. long time ago. <laughs> Probably. I, I think he was speaking in terms of WrestleMania. Sure. No, that's, yeah, that's, that's Cena in a nutshell. Anyway, as great as his promos are, he's always going to have a little bit of hyperbole in there. But he, I agree. I think it was a great promo to be had. Um, I still question the possibility that it might not happen. Considering I don't know what else Cena's going to do, and I, I'm like 
89% confident that he's not walking away with the title. He, at the very least, shouldn't be walking away with the title. So here's hoping that 89% is correct. We'll just have to see, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This whole Cena now, thing is odd. <laughs> now, see, I know that Cena versus Taker is happening because Taker dyed his fucking beard. Oh, okay. So he's gearing up for another fucking mania match, and there is no god because <laughs> the last Taker match sucked ass. Right. So obviously we have to have another one to correct for that. <laughs> yeah, and and it, it's tough call too because on the one hand, my knee jerk is to say, well, he was uh you know dancing opposite. Roman Reigns last time, and I don't mean to say that Roman is a terrible hand in the ring, but I, I think that's not exactly the best person that you want to be dancing with on your last yeah. match. Yeah, he, he, he can't carry people. Yeah. Cena has the possibility to, but then again, a lot of his moves are really like impact heavy, which is probably not good for Taker at this point. So I don't know. I mean, that that defense kind of starts to wear a little thin <laughs> when when yeah. I when I start to make it. So I, I guess we'll just have to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I would I argue like, that Cena can't carry people because Reigns yeah. is a better worker than Cena is. Sure, uh, and, so. and I mean, I think at one time he could. I definitely think, or at least. I guess it's kind of the opposite. I think Cena can be brought to a really great match with a really great dance partner, but I don't know if Taker is capable of being that really great dance partner anymore. So, yeah, yeah and that's, Cena is a guy that can put on a, a a decent match with just about anybody. He's yeah. he's very adaptable. Sure, but yeah, he's not like an AJ or uh, no. you go further back a Shawn Michaels, a guy that right, right, can yeah. bring up those decent talents and make them look like like stars. I agree. So, yeah, it's I I I, I know it's going to happen. I know in my fucking heart of hearts that <laughs> Taker's coming back to face Cena. Yeah, I wish to God it wasn't, but I mean, that has to I'm, be it, though, right? Like, there's literally yeah. nothing left on the bucket list after that. So there is some solace there. Yeah. Yeah, it's just I, until Fastlane is over with, we're, we're I, I, at least we're still going to be stuck with, I'm John Cena, and I'm a 16-time world champion, but guys, I don't have a road to WrestleMania. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, I guess Come going on. back to that bucket list, the only other thing I could think of is Taker Sting, which, I mean, I'm not going to say I would be opposed to if they booked it similar to like a, you know, uh, final deletion or something and protected both guys, but they're not going to do that. And yeah, that is super <laughs> double, never going to happen. So it, right. It's unfortunately, booked. unfortunately, and, and both guys have said that they're not into it. So. Uh, I, I will continue to hope, but I'm not holding my breath. Hmm. Uh, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about Ultimate Deletion already. Yeah, I uh, feel like we kind of talked talked most of it in the news. Yeah. So I guess the only the the last thing of note that took place on Raw, in my mind, uh, was the Symphony of Destruction match, and I I wish this had been the main event. Um, which I mean. The way Raw closed out with Reigns and Heyman was 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 good. It was entertaining. Um, Heyman said some cringeworthy shit, but like, on the whole, I think it was at least as good as the segment that Reigns had last week. Um, yeah. But the Symphony of Destruction match, from start to finish, I think was fantastic. The way Elias just drew things out. And, you know, did his usual stick of I'm not afraid of the monster among men. Also witnessed that I can play more than than the guitar. And I uh, tinkled the ivories a little bit, played some drums and whatnot. And, uh, you know, he asked for a second proper entrance. And the lights went out. And light, the spotlight came on the, uh, the stool in the middle of the ring. And Elias is nowhere to be seen until the lights come up. And he is booking it for the garage. Uh, so, like... Right there, I knew we were going to get something fun. And he hops in the car and he's 
thinking, damn, I made it. I am so slick. And he starts to peel out. And lo and behold, Braun is behind him, lifting the back end of the car up. <laughs> it's basically being a beautiful, badass monster. Chases him back towards the ramp. I did the match ever actually. No, it, it had to have started because he actually did pin him towards the end. Um, so long story short, Braun just beats the holy hell out of Elias using anything and everything he can get his hands on. Uh, plays the piano himself and then promptly drops it on Elias. And <laughs> the entire time, Corey is just firing off Megadeth album names and, and lyrics just left and right and just being glorious in his own right. And like the Megadeth fan in me was, was just going ape shit all over the place because Braun's little video package beforehand actually threw out the line countdown to extinction. Like, I, I'm just losing my mind as this is unfolding before me. And then after it all, Corey pops out with, if this doesn't get me free tickets to Megadeth, I don't know what will. <laughs> That was pretty great. Yeah, I, I, I am strongly considering starting a petition to make that happen to get yeah. Corey Grace's free mega death. Same so, change dot org people. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was that was just fantastic. I I want more of that. The only thing I don't want more of is these dumb little line art rainbow word vignettes that they do, uh, where for emphasis they'll have like the words pop up on the screen like some dumb sing along like that i don't know who got the idea that that was going to be good like it, it feels very youtuber to me and it feels like the youtuber that would come up with that would promptly get like calls for his deletion from the service i i don't know it's, it's a Super dumb move from where I'm sitting, but aside from that, Braun is Braun and Elias are fantastic. I don't know where you go after this, but I hope they can figure something out that's at least as good. Agreed. The only thing I would say moving forward, I just don't feel like Braun Elias is WrestleMania material. I hope that they oh, have no. something better for Braun uh, and Elias, frankly. Uh, leading into leading into the actual show of shows itself. Yeah, I feel like Elias is armbar bound. Sure. I don't know what you do with Braun. Yeah, I'm unsure of that myself. Braun Cena? Uh, I mean, sure. <laughs> I I just don't know how. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, before we left Raw, I know it's it's not technically in the doc, but something I thought of when you brought up the promo. With Roman and uh, Paul Heyman, did we want to unpack the whole like you know potential that that uh, those last couple? So I guess what I'm alluding to is that you know over the past couple of weeks, people have been speculating that these interactions uh, Roman's been having and these promos he's been cutting are a like hard attempt to make him seem the face and which i know he's he's was always going to be the face in this feud but like the face that actually gets cheered uh by the time the match comes along um like there's a bunch of rumors flying around that uh uh they intentionally held brock off tv uh last week to kind of fuel that fire a little bit and still paint him as that part-timer um any worth in talking about that or discussing it at all or I mean, yeah, I, considering that's going to be the main event of WrestleMania. I, sure. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, Yeah. So, like, Roman putting Brock on blast for not being there last week. Um, I saw it being reported that he was not present backstage, neither him or Heyman, mm -hmm. um, which was interesting, considering that both Heyman and Lesnar were in Vegas the night before at Elimination Chamber. Um, you know, Lesnar having his picture taken with Dana White, who knows if that was actually taken that night or if it was a picture from something prior. Uh, 
but yeah, it it was interesting to see that they were advertising Brock being there right on to the halfway point of the show. And uh, like it, it doesn't necessarily mean anything that he wound up not being there. Um, but it, it's it's still an interesting tack to take. And yeah, it, it does feel like this is meant to get Roman sympathy. Just being fed up with, with Brock's bullshit like a lot of people are. Uh, myself included at times. Like, I I think it's ridiculous that he's still a universal champion. Um, I think Joe should have taken it off of him. I think, in, in retrospect, I think Braun could have taken it off of him when he challenged at uh, Hell in a Cell. Hell in a Cell. Yeah, yeah Hell in I a Cell. So. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say Great Balls of Fire, then I thought, right. no, that was Joe. Yeah, that was um, Joe. But yeah. I, I just don't see a discernible reason why Brock still has the belt. Um, cause you could still have Brock versus Reigns for no title and still have it be amazing. Mm, I don't think Vince wants that. I mean, I agree. probably not. I think they could have done that, but I don't think Vince thinks that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like Roman coming out the way he did and you know, he got it. Everybody that, Loves to shoot interviews because everyone's like, well, I'm not supposed to say this, but Brock ain't here. Brock's right. a little bitch. I'm I'm tired of him disrespecting this business. I'm tired of him disrespecting the title. I'm tired of him disrespecting you, me, the boys in the back. Like that whole shtick. Yeah. Like that that's just tailor made to get that audience on his side. Even if it's Roman Reigns. So I, I think that was a good tack to take. I like that they're sticking with it. Um, and yeah, like the, the cringeworthy portions of, of Heyman's address this week aside, I, I think they took the right tack with it. Um, you know, going with a line that you don't want to shoot with Paul Heyman on the mic and you don't want to shoot in the ring with Brock Lesnar. Like I, that was a very good line. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, Heyman being the, 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 the scared little man when, when Roman hits the ring is like, I didn't know you're going to be here. I'm just an advocate. Uh, pick up the belt off the ground. Like, okay, I'm doing that. Yes, sir. Uh, like that whole thing. It's it's just classic heel face stuff, and like it, it's it's good. Sure. Like there's a reason that this is the formula. Like it works. I, I am interested to see what happens next week when Brock shows up. But yeah, yeah. You know. I I agree. I agree. I'm sure that they're gonna stick to the tried and true Brock just runs out and starts beating the shit out of Roman. Uh, like they always do with whoever Brock's fighting. And then he hits a couple of fives and walks out because he's the beast. Um, and that's fine. I'm not against that. You know, like you said, it's tried and true and it works and everybody loves seeing the F five. Um, my only thing with it is I don't think in the long run it's, it's going to work the way the WWE wants. I still think there's, going to be just as mixed a crowd at uh at mania as there would have been without this you know people people love to see brock regardless of how you may feel about the universal championship being treated or where he falls morally and stuff like that people love suplex city um Mm -hmm. particularly being that roman was the first fucking occupant of suplex city particularly the the one time which i and i i actually really like that because i felt like brock evolved as a competitor with it and yet he's he's not gone back there since but especially because uh you know brock was doing all the variants of of suplex and whatnot which we hadn't seen yet in their first encounter um yeah i think it's still going to be a mixed reaction for roman and a mixed reaction for brock that said I don't think the match is going to suffer for it. I think WWE kind of already knows, you know, how to book their matches with those kind of contingencies in place. I applaud the effort to try and get a more face heel dynamic by the time WrestleMania starts. I just don't think it's going to actually happen. Yeah, it's good to get the ball rolling on that sort of thing, because no matter what town you're in, portions of that audience are very easily molded by what's come before. Sure. Uh, and New Orleans really isn't a smart town. Like, obviously, it's mania. You're going to have that crowd right. uh, filter in because they're coming from all over. But 
I, I think New Orleans is going to be a different beast than, say, Orlando or Chicago or Philadelphia. I, I sure. think you are going to get a crowd that is generally more receptive to Roman. And like, you're still going to have that very vocal contention that is pro Brock. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's just going to end up being more of a general schmoz when sure. it comes to who the crowd is behind, which I, I, I think is just fine uh, yeah. for that kind of main event. Sure. It's to be expected. Uh, but that's pretty much raw in a nutshell. Uh, moving on to SmackDown, uh, it was a go home show for Fastlane, uh, which in typical WWE fashion, not a lot of note took place. Uh, kind of a, uh, running through the cast of characters, if you will. Um, yep. now there, there was a little bit of an interesting note, uh, in the main event, uh, Wherein everybody but Cena wound up being thrown into a fatal five way because why save the main event for Sunday when you can just have it on the go home show? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, but prior in the show, Sammy uh, made a big deal out of laying down for Owens because while his time as champion will come down the line, right now it's about protecting Kevin. And, uh, you know, they hugged it out, uh, reaffirmed their friendship. What a great guy Sammy is. What a great guy Kevin is. And then, uh, yeah, everything happened the way it did and wound up with uh, Zane giving Owens the Huluva kick to roll him up for the victory. And the show closed out with Zane not exactly turning on Owens. Right. But... Just stating that he is the best that WWE has to offer, has been since day one, and nobody's given him the props. But presumably that will change, Kamania. Uh, was this a, a, a worthwhile go-home moment? You know, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess for the multi-man match, yes, because now there's some sort of question in mind, which I think they're going to play up. Uh, as to whether Zayn and Owens are a functional team going into that match or if they're just looking out for themselves. The broader question for me, um, going past the, the go home moment is if there are plans to have a Owen Zayn singles match at mania, does this mean that Sammy's going to play the heel? Cause I sure don't know how I feel about that. I've been interested to see Sammy's heel stuff where he's base. I mean, yeah, sure. He still bitches and moans like any other heel does, but for the most part, like he's still a happy go lucky dude. He's just saying things that people don't like anymore. And that's been an interesting thing. This stuff that we saw before is a little bit more generic heel stuff for people that don't really have a clearly defined heel character and putting all that aside. I mean, Owens is possibly the best heel on the roster right now. Having him be a face going into Mania, I, they haven't totally confirmed that yet, but God, that seems weird at the very least. I I can't say I'm not curious to see how a match between them would take place with the morality roles reversed, but I don't know, man. It, it just feels more and more like they have had no idea what to do with Zayn and Owen since Hell in a Cell. Um, oh, that's right. Hell in a Cell was SmackDown. So I don't know what show uh, Braun and Brock fought at this year, but it wasn't Hell in a Cell. Because that was a SmackDown pay-per-view this year. Uh, either way, I I'm I'm definitely weirded out by the development. And it certainly seems to suggest, at least for this week's show, that Owens and Zayn are going to cancel each other out in the in the six pack challenge. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I just felt weird about it. It felt like a weird decision. I think if I hadn't already been sitting down, I think I would have had to, when I started thinking about what if Kevin turns face and Sammy's the bad guy. Yeah. That like, cause Kevin and Sammy haven't really been bad guys. Right. Like they, they've been jumping people and they've been dicks to a lot of people, but, in the, the broader scope of things, Shane is the asshole, not them. 
so like Sammy especially has has been that guy. He's been that good guy carrying his friend's flag, even though his friend is a dick. Like the how do I say this? Like the greatest act of compassion is to to share the burden of of a truly despicable human being. Like like. That's the kind of vibe I've been getting from Sammy this entire time. Yeah. Like, him being the best friend to, to Kevin, even when, if Kevin arguably doesn't deserve it. But for him to, like, well and truly stab Kevin in the back and make him turn actual good guy, like, indisputable good guy, that I, I, I don't even know what that would look like in WWE because, Heel Sami Zayn on the indies has always been fucking weird. Yeah. Like, he he went some really weird places with that. So, it, it's more that I can't fathom what a truly bad Sami Zayn would look like. Because good guy Kevin Owens, I, I, I can wrap my head around. I, I've seen that in Ring of Honor. Sure. It, it, it totally works. It, it's just that I I don't no, this will ever happen, but I really want Kevin and Sammy to get over on, on Shane, most of all. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, I agree. That's... I agree. And that's why I think another reason why this feels so out of left field, this feels very self-contained between Sammy and Kevin. Yeah. I suppose it could be some sort of long con against Shane, but it certainly, it certainly doesn't seem like that is, you know, on the bubble even right now. It, I don't know how you would loop that back into this. And I'm not saying that Kevin especially cannot be at the very least a sort of stone coldy anti hero uh face. Uh, I've seen that before many times, too, in, in many promotions. But he's just such a goddamn good heel, man. And and uh, fucking Sammy's a great face. And that's the dynamic that really works. And I, I mean, I, I like experimentation, but. I don't know. I'm just, I feel weird. I feel weird, man. I feel weird. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like realistically, this is just a way to ensure that it really is every man for themselves in there. Yeah. Like, there are no friends. There are no allies. It, it's going to be knock down, drag out until AJ pins Ziggler. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's... That is just such a weird scenario to have play out in your head. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I guess that is it for SmackDown. Um, I haven't really been watching NXT lately. Uh, but I I am given to understand that the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic is kicking off tonight. Uh, has already kicked off tonight, I guess, and wrapped its first episode maybe. By the time of this recording, probably um, TM61 was squaring off against the Authors of Pain uh, in a rematch of the main of of the uh, final match of last year's Dusty Classic. Hopefully, TM61 uh, avenged a loss. I don't know yet, but uh, yeah, that that should be fun given the the field involved. Um, did we want to talk about the thing that you? Uh mentioned two weeks ago that was spoiler heavy that hopefully all of our listeners at least have, have watched in the two weeks since uh i don't know what thing you're talking about <laughs> the uh the nxt title match and the fallout from it oh <laughs> yeah uh sure um i don't really know where things are going there but uh yeah uh, so Gargano and Almas had their rematch. Um, the, uh, what was it? It was, it was career versus title. And if Gargano lost, he would have to leave NXT. And that is exactly what had happened. Um, Almas retained his championship and Gargano is done with NXT. Um, a few days ago, he had his last NXT house show in Cleveland, his hometown. And, yeah, he's probably going to be showing up on 205 Live, uh, perhaps after Mania? Or perhaps at Mania? 
or leading into it? I I would doubt that just because I I think he would show up once the new champ is crowned at Mania. Oh, it's going to be a Mania that they're crowned. I thought they were going to Yeah, the the final round is is happening at Mania. Okay, I did not know that. Yeah, so I I fully expect Gargano to show up the night or maybe the raw after. I don't I don't I know if they would wait for that or for the next 205 Live uh, on uh, Tuesday. I could definitely see him getting a Ziggler-esque pop if they did that. When when he cashed in, not right now, obviously, when he cashed in the money in the yeah. bank. That pop. <laughs> what, just a record <laughs> scratch and then like 20 seconds <laughs> yeah. of silence? Yes, yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, God, Ziggler's entrance sucks. Yeah, it really um, does. And they fucking wasted anything they could have done with him that was interesting at the Rumble. Damn it. I'm still salty about that. Yeah, and he's he's not a – he's a dick again. Like, he's not trying to be a good guy anymore. Like, what the fuck are they doing with it? Why is he still working there? Yeah. I don't fucking know. <laughs> Agree. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, speaking of 205 Live, uh, the second round is done now, I think. Yes. Yeah, second round is done. They're moving on to the semifinals next week. Uh, but in order for that to have happened, uh, we saw last week Cedric Alexander defeated TJP and Roderick Strong went over Kalisto in a very weird decision. Uh, and then this week, Drew Gulak murdered Mark Andrews uh, and Mustafa Ali defeated Buddy Murphy. And I... Have yet to watch the the Gulak and Ali matches, uh, but I saw the promo that Mustafa Ali produced uh, prior to his match with Murphy, and goddamn, is that dude ever the man for the cruiserweight division? Like he is the guy, barring a Neville return, he is going to be the biggest star in that division because that was some next level shit. Like, I haven't seen delivery like that on 205 Live maybe ever. I, uh, like, did, have, have you had the chance to see that, that video package? Uh, I have not yet, but I, I would, it was great. I would definitely recommend the YouTube because th- this was okay. very different. Uh, okay. Not a WWE production. Uh, for one thing, uh, none, of the, none of the line art word bullshit. Uh, also, like... No jumpy camera cuts. Like it, it was shot on somebody's phone, and the, the editing, the the delivery by by Ali himself, and the pacing of the promo. Like I, I want more of that because if it was scripted, it definitely didn't sound that way. Like this felt like something genuine, like something real from him. And I I haven't heard enough of that from Ali before on on 205 Live. Like, that's something I want more of. I want more of that character. I want to see more of what he says on Twitter come out on the actual product. Because the the dude is just a genuine inspiration. When when you follow him and his interactions with people, like, it's genuinely heartwarming. And then, like, last week uh, when he had... Or not last week. Um, it, it was it was a recent taping where I uh, they're up in the Chicago area, and uh, like after the show went off the air, like his daughter was in attendance, and she came up to him at, at ringside, and they had a little moment there, and like that was amazing to see, just, just him with his daughter. That is a guy that you could put the show on his back and have him just run with it, and I. I Genuinely hope that that dude ends up being crowned champion in Mania. I I really hope so. Uh, but yeah, that is two hundred five live. That is the recap in a nutshell. Uh, which leaves us with Fastlane. So there are six matches currently booked for Fastlane. Uh, we have Becky Lynch and Naomi versus Natalia and Carmella, Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rusev. Bobby Roode defending the United States Championship against Randy Orton. Charlotte Flair defending the SmackDown Women's Championship against Ruby Riot. 
The New Day are challenging the Usos for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships to become five-time, three-and-enough-man-I-need-five-time champions. And AJ Styles is defending the WWE Championship against John Cena, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Dolph Ziggler, and Baron Corbin. All right, so uh, on paper, it looks like a really solid card. Sure. I I, I would definitely hope so, given how just tepid this go-home show was. Right. Um, but right off the bat, what's looking to you like the match of the night? Uh, I mean, New Day versus Usos is going to be fucking amazing. Um, I think Shinsuke versus Rusev could be interesting. Uh, and and mm-hmm. I think the the uh, the six pack challenge is going to be, you know, schmozzy and, and fun as all get out as as typically multi-man. WWE matches are, um, but I, I think match of the night goes to the tag team title match. Uh, just I don't think anyone's going to even come close to the shit they're doing. And they've had like what three or four months to kind of recharge the batteries and come up with new shit that they haven't done yet. So yeah, I think New Day Uso is going to be a barn burner, as they say. Yeah, it's really hard to argue against New Day versus Usos. Um... Nakamura and Rusev could be a really good Dark Horse candidate, um, because both of them are out of their minds when it comes to talent and and charisma and and pretty much everything. Uh, It's just that the booking hasn't been there. Um, I think we're going to be surprised by the women's title match, just because Ruby is a really good worker. It's just we haven't really seen them put the effort into making any of the Riot Squad look truly competitive uh i i think i'd have to agree with you that like again it's really hard to bet against the new day versus usos in any scenario like they just haven't had a bad match yet right uh but let's go down the line here starting with the non-title matches uh becky and naomi versus natalia and carmella who do you have walking away with the victory here uh i'm going with natalia and carmella uh i know I, I mean, actually, I really, I really don't know if there's any sort of story building into this. Um, but I, 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 and I also know that that typically Money in the Bank winners kind of go on pretty significant losing losing streaks. I think in an effort to sort of mask any potential cash in. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I just have a, a gut feeling that. You know what? Natalia and Carmella haven't really had a, a super win in the last month or two, maybe three months, even if you want to stretch it that far. Uh, and and I think they'll get the win here. Yeah, it feels like neither of them have really had a victory since the welcome committee was a thing. Yeah. I don't even think they've really been on TV all that much since the welcoming committee was a thing. Well, Natalia was champion. For a couple months there, but outside of that, since no. the she she wanted it, uh, uh, she wanted it. Uh, I mean, yeah, like when when the committee was first put together, yeah, but they're like they kind of split up after Money in the Bank, but then they briefly came back together when the Riot Squad came up and started wreaking havoc. Right. Well, uh, Natalia's win was at uh, SummerSlam, and she was kind of on her own at that point, and then they kind of came back together again. I think after she lost, I don't know. It wasn't a very memorable. Yeah, I, I don't remember. Title win. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am going to bet on Becky and Naomi in this scenario. Um, more because of what you mentioned before about Carmella being on a losing streak. Um, I I think this is just going to add to that. Um, just kind of push her deeper under the radar before she does cash in. Uh, and that Becky and Naomi really haven't had much going on either. So, you know, this would be a good win for Becky, a good win for Naomi. Um, maybe raise the specter of Becky making a push for a title again in the near future. I don't know. Uh, but this is a match that I could really see going either way for, for equally good reasons. Uh, next on the card, Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rusev. I don't see why you have Nakamura lose on on the way to WrestleMania. Yep. Especially not 
with him having been so absent until this week. Uh, and it's, I mean, sadly, it's Rusev. <laughs> Rusev yeah. just doesn't win. That That's just his thing now. I agree, um, especially considering that uh, I still believe they're they're building towards a singles program between AJ and Shinsuke, and it only makes sense to have them both win on the same night, uh, and then you know just go on to WrestleMania from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much my read too. Uh, Bobby Roode versus Randy Orton for the U.S. Championship. This is one where I feel like uh, th- this is one of those ones where I feel like the face champion is going to win uh, to to give the crowd something that they want. And uh, something to walk away happy with uh, because of other things that are going to happen tonight. And I I don't see Orton being satisfied as United States champion either. Like, I, I don't think he would be happy winning this and then having to defend it moving forward. So I, I, I think this is a rude match to win here. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think this is just a uh, just to give Rude a defense going into. Uh, Going into WrestleMania, um, I don't see any reason to put it on Randy. I, Randy possibly, actually, no, 100% definitely is less interesting than he was last year. And last year he was WWE champion. Um, and, and it's not by much. It's not by much of a less interesting, but still less. And uh, I just don't see any reason to make him U.S. champion other than a rematch with Bobby. I feel like Bobby has better things to do, to be honest. So I'm picking Bobby Roode. The possibility of a no contest is being floated in the chat uh, because of Jinder getting involved. I, I I very much see the possibility of Jinder involving himself in order to force a triple threat at Mania. But... I, I wouldn't see that ending in a no contest. I would see that being him attacking Rude and forcing a DQ win for Rude. Um, but that that's just how I would see that unfolding. But yeah, like uh, Jinder getting involved for for the triple threat at Mania. Like, yeah, that does seem very likely. Agreed. Uh, bu- 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 the SmackDown Women's Championship. Charlotte Flair versus Ruby Riot. Uh, where do you see that uh, going? Like, do you see Charlotte retaining, or maybe Ruby taking the title from her? I think sh- I think this may truly be the night that uh, that Carmella cashes in, uh, and with that, I think it makes more sense to keep the belt on Charlotte, and that becomes the program leading into WrestleMania. It's entirely possible that they keep it. Uh, that they keep it, they, they keep the story between the Riot Squad and Charlotte Flair. Um, but the only other place I could see them going at Mania is possibly having, uh, possibly having like the rest of the Riot Squad as like, I don't know, Loverjacks and or, you know, even being directly involved in the match and making it a handicap match. Um, I don't think that's a terrible idea considering all the talent involved, but I, I would, I mean, knowing that, WrestleMania tends to like to gravitate towards those singles, uh, you know, epic one-on-one confrontations. Um, I think WWE would prefer, and I would kind of prefer too, to actually see Carmella in, you know, a, a power position leading into Mania and getting that sort of, uh, you know, heel face dynamic between her and, and Charlotte going into the show. I think that, I think that would work very well. And I would like to see Charlotte be, I mean, sorry, I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to see Carmella. Sorry. I had a brain fart there. Uh, be a little bit more like involved as, as a character, you know, um, she, when she had first won the money in the bank briefcase, she had this sort of air about her, um, that she was not to be messed with and to watch out for her, you know, when she cashes in, I know that we've also started to go into very generic money in the bank booking territory. Um, and that's fine. I, I, I definitely like a little bit of a shock, even if, even though I'm, I'm sitting here and actually predicting that it's going to happen tonight, but, uh, or on Sunday, I still think it's a good direction to go. in. I, I want to see that, you know, singles competitor, 
sort of ruthless streak that we saw in Carmella before. So I'm I'm saying Charlie retains and then is cashed in on by uh, by Carmella. Okay, I am leaning in an opposite direction. I am. I think Ruby takes the title from Charlotte at Fastlane, and I think we see Charlotte Chase going into Mania uh, with with no involvement from Carmella this coming Sunday. I I feel like the plan moving forward is for the rematch to take place at Mania, and Charlotte reclaims the title there, and then Carmella cashes in on her successfully. Because uh, it, it feels like if they're holding it off uh, for this long, then I feel like they're they're trying to make as big a statement with a cash in as possible for the for the first women's money in the bank cash in, um, which I mean, Sabrina stage of them all. So I, that 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 feels to me where they're headed with that one. Uh, moving on to the New Day versus the Usos for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships. Uh, hmm. this one could really go either way. I feel like, uh, I, I don't think there's a clear favorite, but what do you think? Do the users retain or do, or does the new day become five time champions here? I think that I, I, I would like to see the new day as champions. It feels like the Usos have had the titles for a good little while. Um, I think the Uso, I, I like the, sort of idea that New Day was, you know, not even competing last year at Mania. They were just the hosts. This year they come into Mania with the titles. Um I, I like that. I like that sort of I don't know what you call it, juxtaposition, I guess. Um I, I like that just leading into Mania. I like that that visual. Uh that said, if the Usos retain here, I'm not gonna be mad about it. If they want to repeat regardless of who uh leaves with the titles. If they want to repeat this match of mania, I'm not mad about that either. Um, so, I mean, I don't think there's really any losers here when you actually stop to think about it, but I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say, this is where the new day becomes five time, uh, you know, Booker T uh, champions at this point. And, uh, I'd like to see them go into mania with the titles. I think the new day kind of lit a fire under the Usos, uh, the, these past couple of weeks. Um, I think they got complacent after their, their truce of the new day. I think the, the feud was sh- with uh, Chad Gable and Shelton Benjamin. Yes. What it was, I, I think it lulled them into it, uh, into complacency. I'll say it again. Um, and then hearing that, that interaction with them, last week played back this week uh that like those shots about the new day not needing their daddies to get where they are right now and the usos talking about having been passed over for nine years at every wrestlemania by either being pushed to the pre-show or left off the card entirely i think the usos are are even though they're champions, I feel like they're hungrier. I feel like they have more to prove here. I think the Usos are going to retain. Uh, I I feel like it's going to be by exceedingly dastardly means. And I think it's it's just going to leave the door wider open for a rematch at Mania, where there the New Day become five-time champions. Five? 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 Five-time champions. <laughs> and now the WWE Championship Six Pack Challenge match. Um, I, I won't even bother to ask the question. It is just exceedingly ludicrous to even entertain a scenario where anyone but AJ Styles wins this thing. Because you know, Sammy and Kevin are going to neutralize each other. Baron is going to squander his opportunity because that's what he does. Cena, I don't know. He joins Baron in the squandering and he just points and laughs at him while AJ rolls up Dolph. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess that's just how it's going to unfold. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think kind of like we said earlier in the show, the only other person I can see 
possibly entertaining the notion of winning would probably be Cena. And I don't really like entertaining that notion, no. if I'm being honest. I would much rather just let Shinsuke and AJ just run wild at, at Mania and have Cena do, I mean, literally anything else. Or, you know, I'm not too sad if Cena isn't at Mania. I know that's a fucking pipe dream and it'll never happen, at least until Cena is forced into a, uh early wheelchair or grave. But... It's something that I wouldn't mind if it were to happen that way. Um, yeah, I, it's it's got to be AJ. It's got to be AJ. Yeah, I I don't see any other option because I've said it before. I'll say it again. The crowd is just so hot for AJ versus Shinsuke. <laughs> Anything else would be a mistake. Yep. Uh, but that is our uh, fast lane prediction. Uh, we're pretty split on on. The women's tag match. More than confident that Shinsuke is going to beat Rusev. Bobby Roode will retain the U.S. Championship. Um, anything can happen in the women's championship match. Um, similarly with the SmackDown Tag Team Championships. But AJ Styles will be the undisputed WWE Champion forever until Mania happens. Exactly. Uh, and that, I believe, is going to bring this show to a close. So, uh, thank you for bearing with us as, as we get back into the groove after a week off. Um, if, if you are eager to see how we do in our road back to podcasting competence on this road to WrestleMania, you can find us at fans.podcast.com. That is where all of our stuff is. That's where you can find the archive. That's where you can find links to our Facebook group, as well as our Discord chat. Uh, that's where we're holding a live chat. For this very show, that is where we're going to be having a live chat for Fastlane this Sunday, as well as WrestleMania in a little over a month's time. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at Fans Talk Podcast. There you can get in touch with us and send us topics you'd like us to discuss. Uh, use that hashtag AskFTPW for extra fun. If you consume the show through any podcatchers such as Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or through an app like SoundCloud or TuneIn Radio, anything of the sort, Please give us a rating, leave us a review, leave us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you guys. Next week, we are going to be unpacking Fastlane. I almost said Elimination Chamber, but it's going to be Fastlane. <laughs> um, and we will be well and truly on the road to WrestleMania full bore, in full swing. Probably going to get more shitty Kid Rock. There's going to be a Flo Rida song in there somewhere. I, I'm positive. Uh, so... Enjoy and endure that along with us. But until then, for Adam, Garvin, everybody in the live chat, my name is Nick, and we will see you next time here on Fans Talk Pro Wrestling. Good night, y'all.